It's a big week for retail, but before that, things just got tougher for Peloton. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill, and I'm joined by Motley Fool senior analyst Jim Gillies. Happy Monday. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. Well, let's start with Peloton, which is <laughs> cutting nearly 800 jobs closing some amount of its locations. And along with these moves, Peloton is raising prices on some of its equipment. And I'll just spot you up with the the <laughs> most illuminating comment from CEO Barry McCarthy, who said in a memo to employees, we have to make our revenues stop shrinking and start growing again. Cash is oxygen. Oxygen is life. And I don't disagree with that, Jim. But uh, when you and I were chatting earlier today, I said to you, when I first saw this story, the immediate thought I had was, this seems like a panic move. Yeah, you're going to get me in trouble, Chris. Oh, <laughs> it's one of those shows. Good. <laughs> uh, Peloton. Yeah, it's a panic move. And yes, he's entirely correct of everything he said. Uh, might have been nice if the founder, former management who ran this truck into the dirt might have actually, I don't know, thought about that once or twice before, as I said, running this truck into the dirt. Um, this is a company, oh, where's my notes for this here? This is a company that has in the most recent balance sheet, I think they're going to report their fourth quarter fiscal earnings. I think they have a June fiscal year, so they're reporting late August if uh, last year's anything to go on. Most recent balance sheet, $1.4 in inventory moldering on the balance sheet, $1.9 in cash burned in the first three quarters of the present fiscal year. Nice of the CEO to tell us that cash is oxygen after starving the business. Well, not his fault, but the entire management suite starved the business. Uh, this is a business where the CFO, I believe last November, the now former CFO uh, on the conference call, oh, no, we don't need to raise capital. And I think eight days later, they raised capital. Um, this is a company with $880 million in cash on the balance sheet, uh, roughly the same amount as the debt on their balance sheet. Now, fortunately for Peloton, the debt on the balance sheet is all convertible debt, doesn't convert, I believe, until 2026. Uh, that the convert price is well over $100. There's no danger of this. When we get there, there's certainly no danger of this company um, uh, needing to uh, put shares. They'll have to pay that back. But hey, you know what? If the fire's not out by then, it won't matter. I don't know what credit line available. But this is a company that's probably going to have to raise capital again, frankly, in the next quarter or two, uh, because they're burning $600 million dollars a quarter the last three or four quarters in a row. Uh, they've got negative product gross margin, which I guess makes sense uh, why they're saying, hey, we're going to raise prices. Might be nice to not, you know, not lose money on every single bike and treadmill they put out the door. Product revenue was down 40% year over year, 25% quarter over quarter Q2 to Q3. Um, and did I mention the the and, and to put it into perspective, you know, like that one point that one point four billion in inventory on the books, that's up from nine hundred and thirty seven million at the start of this fiscal year. It's up from two hundred and forty five million, you know, at at the end of fiscal twenty twenty. Um, this is a company that has inventory bloated themselves to frankly near death. And I am reminded when I see when I see what the what the CEO has said, and again, it's not his fault. He came in from, I believe, Spotify, and I think he was from Pandora before that, uh, which of course was, I believe, purchased by Spotify, uh, or maybe that was serious. Anyway, the man has. He was some, at Netflix some, at one point. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I just I'm reading his bio here off Cap IQ, so I think his most recent gig. Oh no, I don't really know, but it, you know, he was. Uh, he has, yeah, he was at Netflix as uh, CFO, I think, from 99 to 2010, it says here. Uh, more recently, he was at uh, Spotify. He does have financial chops, so that's good, like, you know, because, you know, <laughs> this is a guy who's going to understand, um, 
you know, hey, we're, we're in trouble. I am concerned he's come along a little too late. And I'm always reminded when a, a serv- uh, uh, something like this comes along, I'm reminded of, as I'm often reminded in situations like this, by a, a quote from Warren Buffett or Uncle Warren E. Buffett. Uh, and the quote is, when a management team with a reputation for brilliance tackles a business with a reputation for bad economics, it is the reputation of the business that remains intact. And the economics for Peloton went over the cliff real fast. And like I said, you know, like they're in their most recent quarter, they burned over $700 million. They've got $800 million in cash. So do you really want to be raising like I like the, and I mentioned that prior capital raise that the CFO apparently had, didn't even have a week's view into her business at the time or eight days. Sorry. They raised capital, uh, I believe, in the lower early 40s uh, dollar per share. Uh, stocks in the low teens right now. Like, I mean, like, the more you have to raise capital via equity means, the more you're going to dilute present shareholders. So for those who have held through like a 90% drop, and I'm sorry, we're, I'm so dour out of the gate. Like, yeah, you, you fed me, you, you fed me the disaster uh, going here. We'll be, we'll be better in a bit. If they do have to raise capital, and I kind of hope they don't for shareholders who who still own this thing, but I, I I'm not seeing a lot of I'm I'm not seeing a lot of uh, turnaround potential. And, and just to go back to one more point, when they when they said you know that we we need to raise prices, or they're going to raise prices, I think they're raising prices on their bikes by like 500 bucks a, a bike, and I think it's 800 bucks per unit by the treadmill. Um, but remember how I mentioned they were they had negative gross margin on like like. They're moving product just to get it out the door the last three quarters. Like it's, it's like it's already not selling, and now you're raising the price. Like, good luck. And I, I don't have a lot sunnier disposition to say here. I'm afraid. Well, I didn't ask you to come on just for your sunny disposition. Um, <laughs> good. But before we move on to retail, though, what would you ask? Uh, McCarthy on the conference call, assuming they come out with, uh, you know, a report that um, does not indicate some radical reversal of fortune. What is the question you would ask? Would it be around a capital raise? Because it does. I mean, when you just run the numbers, it's hard to imagine they don't get money somehow, somewhere. They they have to get money somehow somewhere. I I have a difficult time believing, um, and and belief is always a terrible word to use with investing because you know uh, I can believe a great many things, but cash cash kind of doesn't lie. Uh, this is a company that that burned uh, about seven hundred and thirty five million in the most recent quarter, uh, about five hundred and fifty million the quarter before that. Uh, about uh, 645 million the quarter before that. Like I said, they've got about 880 million cash on the books. Pretty much the value of that. Where is your cash coming from, Barry? Where is your next capital coming from? Because I I think this is a business that they ha- you have to demonstrate you're going to survive the next year. And then you can talk about growth and maybe adding to those subscriptions. The subscriptions are actually monetizing fairly well. Uh, you know, people who love their Pelotons, um, you know, the, the number of uh, fitness sessions after spiking during the pandemic with, with a, a reopening world, the degradation there has trailed off. And they look like they're pr- doing fairly decently. You know, it's a small sample set, so I don't want to draw any great conclusions there. But there's some optimism. Like to get to be optimistic in three years and have this turnaround, and they talk very, you know, very directly, and which I like on the most recent um, shareholder letter, the third quarter um, shareholder letter. Although that's a pet peeve of mine as well. That they talk about, hey, you know, we, we, turnarounds are hard. Turnarounds are hard. We're a turnaround now. Okay, good. So you you seem to have a reasonable appreciation of where you are in the pecking order at this point. My questions would circle around, you know. What is your fire suppression plan for the next year? And then we can talk, once the fire is out, then we can talk about your turnaround because how, um, especially heading into a recession when, assuming we have a recession, I, I, I have some thoughts on that as well, but assuming that you know the, the popular opinion of we're heading into a recession is in fact true, um, 
jack at a price on a souped up treadmill that I have to pay 60 bucks a month for to, to get a subscription is probably not going to clear the books of that bloated inventory. Let's move on to retail then, because it's a big <laughs> now week. Now that I've just killed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big week for retail. We've got earnings reports coming later in the week from Walmart, Target, Home Depot. I don't remember retail, big retail, being as weird as it is right now. And when I say weird, I'm, I'm referring to the fact that, in general, the major retailers tend to travel in a pack. The fortunes of one tend to reflect the fortunes of another. This is certainly the case for years now with Home Depot and Lowe's, where you know they report earnings one right after the other, and whatever you know, it, it's it's much more newsworthy if they don't have similar results than if they do. But at the moment, in part because of what we got three months prior from Walmart and Target with mm -hmm. their inventory debacle. Uh, I, I don't have a great sense of the retail landscape, which is why I'm looking forward to this week, because I feel like we're going to get some more clues into things like uh, inventory controls, uh, back-to-school shopping, and possibly even the earliest of indications around year-end holidays. Um, when you step back and look at retail, does anything stand out to you in particular? Uh, we certainly got that kind of negative surprise, negative reporting from Walmart and Target last go round. Uh, neither of those companies terribly excite me. Uh, they are certainly bellwethers, and we should pay attention to them. But you know, when uh, um, uh, and it, it wasn't just Walmart and, and Target, of course. Like even even going down the quality chain to uh, you know guys like Big Lots or whatever. Um, it it was pretty ugly, kind of across the uh, across the spectrum, uh, because yeah, like inflation seems to have caught them by you know flat footed, so everybody had their inventory uh, spike, uh, inventory spiked because you know in part or I know a lot of their um, a lot of their expenses also got kind of quashed because you know, the higher cost inventory is now moving through your system. Um, I'm not real, like I said, as an investor, I'm not real interested at these large specialty, non-differentiated um, names. The one I love to watch and uh, love to follow is, uh, which you didn't mention, and we'll hit, maybe I'll hit that before we get over to the, the home improvement folks, uh, is Costco. They're on a bit of a different, um, different reporting schedule. I think they report third week of September because I believe they're on a... Uh, June or a September fiscal year, what well, would be September? Um, but you know, Costco is one of those stories where, uh, I mean, they are. I think Costco is hitting on all cylinders. I think to steal a Ron Grossism, um, I think Costco is. Um, every time I walk at it, walk into Costco and walk out of Costco, having you know, having dropped two hundred and fifty bucks on. You know, an order that I planned to be under fifty. I was like, man, I don't own enough Costco. Uh, there are, uh, and and the really interesting thing to me about Costco is, for years, a lot of people would talk about um, how Costco passed on so much of their, uh, so much. I mean, basically, you were buying most goods close to cost because they were making up uh, all of their um, all their profits essentially on selling memberships. And for a time, that was kind of true. About 75% of operating profit, over, I, I was just looking at this last week, uh, the first half of the last decade, about three quarters of their operating profit was, was subscriptions, was memberships. Um, and then it fell to 70%, and then it fell, it fell to 65%, and then the most recent year was 57%. So Costco's not only... Costco is not only growing and doing well in operating profit, I think is up 10 or 11 percent annualized over the past decade, perfectly acceptable, but they've also started uh, to actually make a little bit more profit while keeping that hot dog at $1.50. Uh, so I, my, my favorite retailer, both as an investment as well as just on a personal level, uh, is absolutely Costco. A close second is another one you mentioned, though, which is Home Depot. And Home Depot and Lowe's, yes, you're right, they kind of walk lockstep. Uh, I, I like Home Depot because, um, well, first off, they they decided about a decade ago that they were kind of done 
breaknet expansion and they kind of have gone to, you know, a couple of stores a year opened a few retrofitted, but they've really turned that company into running it for cash. And you just have to look at how the dividend has moved as skyrocketed up over the last few years, as well as the share repurchase. Like when they run that business for cash, all of a sudden they are returning it, all of it to people. And I'm kind of remembering the Bob Nardelli days back in, when was that? Late 2000s when, you know, he was just ruining that company because he wanted to apply um, GE earnings metrics or whatever. And, uh, you know, since his ouster, it's just done so much better. Um, and so I, and, and also too, I, I kind of hold them as, as kind of semi Amazon proof because it's, you know, you're probably not buying a couple thousand square feet of, uh, uh, of drywall uh, from Amazon Prime and having it delivered, I, I imagine you're you're still going through um, through the WalMarts. Or sorry, uh, through the Home Depots. And am I wrong to assume that um, out of both Home Depot and Lowe's, we're going to get some color around, uh, presumably, the benefit of commodity prices coming down? I mean, that has oh, to absolutely. that yeah. has to help them. I mean, just if, all you have to do is look at the cost of lumber in. 2022, and um, that's that's got to be accretive for them. I, I think so. My, now, my question is going to be: I, I don't know the exact number, so I'm going to make them up. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. I was just going to say, you know, well, but it, because it's you know, it's more about presenting a point. Like, let's say lumber prices have come down 50 percent. Has Home Depot passed all that 50 percent to their buyers? Has Lowe's passed all that 50 percent? Have they passed? 30% back to like, like I am reminded here, here in the great white North, we just raised interest rates about a month ago. We went up a full percentage point. The, the bank of Canada raised it by a full a hundred basis points. And that day I got an email from my local credit union talking about the higher interest rates they were paying on short term deposits short, you know, like you know, one, you know, three months to five years. And miraculously, Chris, you know, they went up between ten and forty basis points. So you know, so <laughs> they, did, they didn't like, pass all those savings on to you. Funny thing, isn't it? And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, if uh, you know, if Home Depot and Lowe's and their ilk. I mean, I'm 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 wondering if they've passed all those savings on to you. I'm willing to bet they haven't. Um, so I think uh, uh, I, I I think Home Depot, and then of course Home Depot. I mean, I, we are emerging from pandemic. Closures; those are further and further in the rear view, thankfully. Um, and those are going to be, uh, you know, but people people spend a lot of time on their houses because they had nothing else to do for almost two years. Um, people spend a lot of time and money on their houses. I kind of wonder what uh, if that's going to carry over, or people have kind of gotten used to uh, continued cocooning. How many people are? Uh, how many companies have gone to a, a more hybrid work model? So. There's more people working from home on a regular basis. For someone like me who's been doing it for 20 years, it's kind of you know irrelevant. But um, you know, for for folks who have been doing it for uh, maybe two years and now have the option to work from home three days a week or what have you, uh, maybe they want some more creature comforts than Home Depot and Lowe's can provide. So uh, I, I'm a lot more optimistic about those than I am about the WalMarts and the Targets. Jim Gillies, always great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Shopify is one company tied to retail that's tapping the brakes on its growth, but some companies are hitting the gas pedal. Ricky Mulvey and Sanmeet Deo look at a few businesses playing offense in a tough environment. You're in a recession, we're not in a recession. Today we're looking at some of the companies playing offense in a challenging environment. Joining us now is Motley Fool Senior Analyst, Sanmeet Deo. Good to see you, Sanmeet. Good to see you, Ricky. So, playing offense is a lot easier when the market is raging upward. That's what Shopify did during COVID. And now, some of those companies are feeling a little bit of a hangover. Yeah, you know, so, you know, Toby, Toby Luke wrote in a company wide memo to Shopify, you know, we bet that the channel mix, the share of dollars that travel through e commerce rather than physical retail, would permanently leap ahead by five or even 10 years. We couldn't know for sure at the time, but we knew that if there was a chance that this was true, we would have to expand the company to match. It's now clear that bet didn't pay off. And so it's this idea that 
you know, you can go on offense when your uh, stock price is, is soaring upward, interest rates are low, but then it becomes a lot more difficult when you're in a, a more challenging market environment. And then, you know, Toby was very open in saying that, uh, you know, we made these assumptions about the e commerce market and adoption, and that just didn't play out. And, you know, I, I guess is that is that fundamentally what changed for Shopify? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, they made a big strategic bet, like you said, and one of their biggest mistakes and one of the mistakes that a lot of companies have made during the pandemic that was that its industry growth would extend for a long period of time, possibly even be a permanent shift. And so they grew their headcount expenses to scale up to kind of anticipate that growth. Of course, they didn't take into consideration the effects on e-commerce, Shopify here, um, from a reopening of the economy and shifting consumer shopping habits once that occurs. So this ultimately led to a rapid ascent in expense growth, followed by slowing revenue and decline in margins. Now the company has got to play defense, laying off staff, cutting operating expenses to meet those lower revenue levels. Um, while investors should be ha happy, Shopify is acknowledging this mistake and right sizing. You know, big problem I see is the company may need to be may need to be more aggressive with implementing strategies to kind of grow revenues and gross profits. But because of what's happened, they're 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 playing defense and and kind of catching back up. In your view, are they playing smart defense? You know, it's interesting because I read an interesting take um, about how their take rates are much lower than the competitors of Amazon, eBay. So it's almost like when I read this analysis, it's they're almost under earning. Um, and you know, maybe you know it's time to kind of close that gap and and earn more and and take more offense because you know you can only cut expenses for so long until you really need to ramp that revenue growth. Let's talk about some of the companies going on offense right now. You know, that's not just an idea uh, that's a good idea in and of itself, but you know, when liquidity dries up, the market's down relative to all-time highs. Uh, that's that's when sh that's when some companies are really able to grab market share. Um, any companies you follow that you see going on offense right now? Yeah, you know, one company that comes to mind is Axon. Um, they make tasers and body cameras. CEO Rick Smith recently told the Wall Street Journal, right now I small opportunity. He said, yes, winter's coming, now let's embrace it. So he's buckling down on expenses for business travel and company swag, but he's kind of also encouraging, you know, an aggressive mindset um, in terms of playing offense in, in their yeah. business. He's got a, uh, there's a good Wall Street Journal article about it. And he's got a swag czar, and he kind of lamented <laughs> to the reporter that not every single event needs a t shirt. While the labor market is hot, you're still seeing a lot of these tech companies implement layoffs. And Axon is very much, in some ways, welcoming that, saying, cool, more computer engineers, that's good for us. Let's go find some talented ones for our company. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of shifts happening in the marketplace with companies, maybe people, um, employees leaving companies or, or things happening. Now's the time when you can kind of take advantage of those opportunities. Trade Desk also had a blockbuster quarter recently. That's another company that seems to be going on offense in a challenging environment. Yeah, you know, Trade Desk is, um, you know, they had great earnings report re recently, raised guidance in this kind of environment, which is very, very impressive, raising guidance when some companies are pulling back or, or not giving guidance. Um, you know, many ad tech companies, ad companies like Facebook and, and you know, ad platform companies are feeling the pinch from con um, advertisers pulling back on spend. And some of those, uh, some of those advertisers will pull back on kind of the low hanging fruit uh, stuff that they don't really need to do. But things like Google advertising is much more, much more prominent and, and impactful for them. But um, you know, with with ad, uh, companies pulling ad spend. Apple IDFA privacy changes continue to ripple through the industry. You know, Tradus is playing on playing the offense, and they have been for a while with their new UID2 ad platform, which is gaining traction, is gaining partnerships and integrations with companies like Disney and AWS, and and kind of it's showing the results. And they're 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 very bullish on you know connected TV advertising and where they play in the market and and how they can kind of capture share. Speaking of companies playing offense. I think one frame to use is you look at a growing industry, take a little bit of a macro view, and then you look at the specific companies that are kind of poised to take market share. Um, a few months ago, we visited, a, uh, we looked at a company called Exponential Fitness, 
And, you know, like the, the, you see a lot of fitness companies that are able to use COVID as, COVID as an excuse, or you see some companies kind of shrinking their footprint. This is one that his uh, CEO, Anthony Geisler, has really never leaned on COVID as an excuse. And he's also very much leaning into an international expansion for, for Exponential. Yeah, you know, he, you know, when COVID hit, he was very aggressive and, and fought very hard for his franchisees when it turned, came to, you know, rent abatements, fighting, fighting the government to get, um, you know, COVID um, relief and, and, and pausing royalties for his franchisees and uh, launching online platforms and a digital platform for his franchise. He did a lot, of, a very good job of, instead of blaming COVID, kind of going on the offense. And that, that's kind of continued, especially now with them signing more international agreements, um, master franchise agreements in Japan and, and all across the world. Um, one interesting story that recently came out that, that was very impressive to me was you know, on July 26th of 2022, its competitor, F45 Holdings, came out with some you know rough news announcing a departure of its CEO, reduction in global workforce, sharp cut in its full year guidance for revenue and earnings, and a removal of a financing facility for its franchisees. Um, stock plummeted over 60% in a day and you know usually this would be a not such a great read through for the boutique fitness industry the next day in the morning exponential announced quote it expects to deliver strong results for the second quarter of 2022 and has continued to reinforce his position as a leading provider of boutique fitness globally additionally quote it's on track to meet or exceed guidance metrics for the year and so during that in that press release as well they, they had you know they announced their preliminary second quarter results strong member growth store visits, sales, AUV, you know, average unit volume growth for their stores. You know, very offensive move after, you know, F F forty five's disaster, you know, reassuring investors that we're okay, you know. Um, and I'm an investor in it myself and I was very pleased by it as well. I own shares as well. The only way you can play offense in a tough environment is if you have the balance sheet to back it up. Some of the companies we've talked about, Axon, Exponential, Trade Desk, any balance sheets there stand out to you as for, for companies that could continue to play offense in a tough environment? Yeah, absolutely. Trade Desk, which you know we were talking about earlier um, offline about how you know you wouldn't think like tech companies have have um, or some of these kinds of companies might have super strong balance sheets, but you know they have 1.2 billion of cash on on their balance sheet, no debt, so they're well positioned to to continue to play offense like they've been doing. Um, Axon as well, no debt on their balance sheet, 377 million dollars in cash. Again strong balance sheets that put them in a position to kind of take these offensive maneuvers. Um, Exponential's balance sheet is has some debt but, and it's okay, but the main advantage for Exponential is it's a franchisor. So, you know, launching in international markets, you know, growing their stores as a franchisor, those costs are typically, typically um, um, on the franchisees to open up the store. So, so they can grow and expand in an environment without taking on too much heavy costs in this kind of environment. Now, we've talked about some of the companies with strong balance sheets playing offense. Um, which companies would you like to see off play offense, but maybe their balance sheet is holding them back? You know, They don't have the ability now to uh, go out and make spark, smart acquisitions or really expand in, into new territories. Yeah, you know, the first thing that came to mind um, is Netflix. Um, you know, they're in a very competitive state uh, space. They're looking to find a, kind of find their next leg of growth. Um, they've they've done very well in stream, but now there's there's a lot of competitors out there. You saw Disney recently report that they have in co combination more streaming subscribers than Netflix. You know, they have plenty of cash on their balance sheet, but they have about fourteen billion dollars of debt, and they have a large content spend uh, annually of about seventeen billion dollars that's that's kind of been management recently said that that's kind of where they're going to tap out at and they're not going to continue to go higher but i feel like that the obligations that they have is going to keep them from making any big splash on the acquisition front to kind of build his ad platform or grow its gaming business now they're working with microsoft for their advertising platform and that's 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 probably going to be good in fact trade desk actually mentioned that that would would be a a good move for them um but you know the gaming business they've made some small acquisitions but to make a bigger acquisition to really drive home their their um their position in that industry, they might be held back a little bit and they'd have to grow it more organically than, than otherwise. 
It's on Meet Dale. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ricky. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.